Good evening. Good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about medical emergencies, environmental and behavioral emergencies that we often see in EMS in this profession. Let's start off here with the uh, snake bite, the, the viper that we spoke about with that fang, and that produces a puncture, right? Good. Um, other things that you will see, maybe any of these, these are 12 different signs or symptoms that you may see from a snake bite. Um, you don't have to really go too crazy about it, they're just common sense. There are also the same signs and symptoms from many other things. So just understand that this is a great picture, it shows the puncture uh, from the fang and I wouldn't worry too much about it after that. Okay, so do you remove a stinger from a, that a bee left inside a patient? The answer is yes you do. The most important thing is you never use a forcep um, to remove it. The reason for that is that in the top of the stinger there re resides the poison. If you use a tweezer and you squeeze it, then what you're doing is injecting the poison into the skin. So no forceps, no tweezers to take it out. You use the side of a hard object Credit Such card? as a credit card. How does that get it out? It doesn't have to be out? sterile. <laughs> you just rub it up against the skin and it'll come right yeah. out. Okay? Mm -hmm. The main thing is that you don't squeeze the stinger. Okay? You do not use the tweezers to squeeze the stinger. You take it out like that. Um, it's very simple. Squeezing, rubbing. Um, so what do you do with a bee bite? You want to try to place the injection site below the level of the heart. It's easy when it's a, a leg, a lower extremity. Maybe when it's an arm it's possible, maybe not. You'll have to see. Do not apply cold packs. Do not apply cold packs to snake bites, even though you may think that it would be a good idea. Do not do that. And you can call medical control. Now, what are you going to ask them? This is called a VCB. A VCB, which stands for a venous constricting band. If any of you have ever been to the hospital, your doctor, or ever seen a paramedic at work, this is what we use when we start an IV to either insert an IV or to draw blood. We use this. VCB, it's called. You will not be tested on that. But you should know that a VCB is to occlude just venous return to the heart. It does not and should not be confused with a tourniquet that does what? They call the tourniquet What does a tourniquet do? Stops blood flow, arterial blood flow. Now, yes, those of us that have been doing this more than a couple days still call this a tourniquet. However, it is not the correct name to use. This is called a VCB, a venous constricting band. And the other thing that we taught you how to use, the military or the make it at home yourself, is a tourniquet. This is two different pieces of equipment with two different functions. This is something you will have to ask medical control if they think it's a good idea and if it's something that you should do. The reason to do it is what? To not allow the... the, the right, to not back. allow the venom, venom to, go back to, the heart. to go back to the heart. So you're doing... What is it? Is it is, do you do it differently than you would do a, 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 a tourniquet? Yes, absolutely. You do not want to... You do not want to occlude arterial blood flow. So how do you control that it's only doing this? Because now? you'll do it tight enough to make sure you still have a pulse. Very simple. Is that a different A tourniquet, you never get it, you never have a pulse. You must not have a pulse. But how do you control that you're doing one and not the other? Because the veins are more superficial than arteries. Is it like when they're trying to take blood? Exactly the same thing. Right. So it's just to, to, so 
And now, and it was like, like why do we not do the ice? <laughs> Does it not? A, a lot of other, a lot of other trauma, you, you do ice to, to, to reduce swelling. Right. To, There's a New York State rule not to apply cold packs to. Why? I'm not sure why, but they have that rule. Okay. And the Stumped him. Good. No, on the Environmental. Test, it says credit card or raise the arm. It's just the vote. No. No. You're not supposed to raise the arm? No. 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 What? I killed the guy. Told you, no. <laughs> All right. Lower than the heart. He oh, lost. Oh. Always below. Below the heart. He lost versus he below. gained. This is what we're going to talk about now. If you're interested, we can send you this picture. It's not in your books or slides. If you're interested, you can post this on the group, and you can see how these things work. Typically, you do not need to know for EMT school how these work, okay? You need to know that all these are methods that the body uses to remove heat, okay? So these are methods that the body uses to remove heat. How exactly, you can read here on the slide if you're able to read it, if he sends it out to you. So again, more important than learning what each one is, learn them as a group, these are things that do what? Uh, lose heat. They use, lose heat. They use this to reduce heat. Very good. All right. So we're going to talk about first cold emergencies. All right. Something that we see here in New York in the winters very often. And the first thing we're going to deal with is this word, hypothermia. Right? Hypo, you know, means low. low. Thermia is heat. Right? Hypothermia, lowering, lowering of the body's temperature. So what makes somebody more likely to be hypothermic? And we always think of the very old and the very young. These are the two groups that um, will be hypothermic much quicker than anybody else. Sometimes they even say on the radio, go check your elderly neighbors to make sure they have heat and whatever, because they are more predisposed to hypothermia. So these are people we got to worry about. All right. This is a very important fact and something that you need to know as an EMT. A wet, a dripping wet patient who was immersed or is still immersed in water will lose heat at a rate of 20 times faster than a patient who is on the dry land. So, if you go into Central Park and one patient is immersed in water, let's say up to their chest or their neck, not drowning, we're not talking about that problem, and the other patient is laying on the grass, and they're both in exactly the same cold temperature, sleeping, whatever it is, who is the most serious patient? The one in the water, right? Now remember this, remember this fact that a patient who is wet, patient who is immersed or is wet or has water on them, is what? Will lose heat, what? Faster than the patient just in plain air. And we'll get back to that thought a little bit later on. If the patient on dry land, is he, is he full of water too? Even though he's not in water, is he wet? No, he's dry. <laughs> okay, we'll get back to that soon. So here we have some information just for you to understand. You have these numbers, all right? Let's just run through it really quickly. First of all, what is a normal human's temperature? 98.6, all right? When, when a patient's body, core body temperature, Core body temperature. When we talk about core temperature, how are we getting there? Ellie? The amount of the core. How are we measuring it? Rectally. Rectally, right? What? It's like, it's like when they ask me, what's the difference in the ER between the red thermometer and the blue thermometer? You ever saw that? There's two next to each other. People ask me, what's the difference? The difference is the taste. So, <laughs> so, between 90 and 95, when it drops below 95, 
when it drops below 95, we will get shivering. Shivering <laughs> is the first reaction that the body will oh. use. Think of it as the body's going to go into shock. There are certain things, certain mechanisms to help the body do what? Compensate. Right? In shock, we compensate by doing X, Y, and Z. We got tachycardia, we get tachypnea, we got all sorts of stuff, right? So, in cold environments, in cold um, hypothermic emergencies, we also have compensation and mechanisms to compensate. First thing we're going to do, the body's going to do, is shiver. Shiver, that is the first thing the body should do. Now we're going to do foot stamping, and sometimes we're going to speed up our breathing, tachypnea, tachycardia. These are all possible things that the body will do because the body needs a certain temperature, and it wants to maintain that temperature. Which organ is in charge of thermoregulation? Skin. Skin. Very good. I have a question. Which... Uh... Why, what does the foot stomping and the shivering help? How does More that movement. Bring, movement. 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 Is, is, it brings heat. Produces heat. So okay. if, you, if you shivered by yourself, if you cause yourself to shiver, Yo, you'll heat stop up. shivering. You're you'll heat up. Right. So, now we drop below 90. Now, so we've gone from 98.6, we drop below 95, we got to about 90. These are the things that's happening. This is the guy, he's shivering. Wow. Great picture, okay? He's smiling. <laughs> because he's still compensating. All right? Now we drop below 90. We drop below 90, and what happens is that the shivering stops, and we're going to start having cognitive slowdown. We're going to start not really being with the program. AMS is going to start kicking in. We're going to become lethargic. All right, so the pro bodily processes are going to slow down. When we go between 85 and 80, now we have complete lethargy, which is just a fancy word for being lethargic. Um, now we're going to see bradycardia and bradypnea. Always, it goes up to start, up is to compensate. Down. Brady is when we're slowing down and where, ending. Where do you, st where do you start Freezing. seeing that? The bradycardia. 885. We're going to start seeing bradycardia and bradypnea. Uh, below 80, well, it says it here. That's it. Game over. Is that bad? You're done? Yeah. Is that bad? Yeah, imminent death is usually bad. Okay? So these are just some numbers you should know. How about the, what's it called? They're losing, you know, the. No, this is. This is generalized, not not local. Generalized, the whole body. How do you treat an agent? Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. So, treatment for all environmental aid emergencies. How do we treat environmental emergencies? Remove the patient from the environment. This is a very important statement. Okay, this is a very important statement. How do we... How do we treat all environmental emergencies? Keep calm and get the hell out of it. <laughs> Good. Remove the patient from the environment. And this is number out. one. Which is your Don't treat them there. Number one. If you think about burns, go to burns a minute. What I tell you was the number one treatment. Stop the, burn. Stop the burning, right? It's the same thing. If you have any sort of craziness in any sort of environment, Rule number one, remove the patient from the environment. Now in EMS it's quite easy, why? Because we show up with a big box on wheels, with heat. and that box has heat, and, heat. and blankets, right? So, that's what you need to do. Do you ever have a case where you remove the environment from the patient? No, I never had that, no. <laughs> what do you do when it's freezing cold outside? When's that? I'm waiting. Uh, well, the, other, the other guy. What about a, it? A car accident or something. You try to get an ambulance as fast as possible. Get him inside. Yeah, sure. It's dangerous yeah. to them, I imagine. That's everything, get them inside. Do you everything see, inside. Cool You're talking about your whole scene size up. You still got to do. But everything after your ABCs better be inside the ambulance. All right? 
Unless you're outside on the street and it's a female, you can't do the El Paso. You'd also bring your inside to the bus before you do that. Okay. See how sensitive he is. Fantastic. Good. So, a couple of things I want to mention here. All right? This is a fact that you all need to know. Right down here. We, we may have mentioned this during CPR. If not, we're mentioning it now. Okay? There is a special change to CPR for the hypothermic patient. Yes, you'll be tested on this, okay? There's a special change to your CPR protocol, to what you're going to do for the hypothermic patient. And that is the usual 5 to 10 second carotid pulse check has now changed to 30 to 45 seconds. Carotid? Carotid. 30 to 45 seconds, because if you come and you think somebody be dead, they may or may not be dead based on the hypothermia. So your 5 to 10 carotid pulse check isn't going to be enough. This is an official thing that every EMT must know, and you will be tested on this. So again, what is the change to CPR in the case of the hypothermic patient? You check the carotid pulse for 30 to 45 30 seconds. 30 to 45 Bam. seconds. Good. Should we, change, should we change it to 30 to 45 <laughs> No. We could. Next. Now, this, the these same, things. The same side? 45 seconds? Yeah. You do 20 and 20. No, no, no. One side. Or one side, then the other side. Okay? One side. Next. Two ways of treating hypothermia, okay? Oh, we'll get to this in a minute. Let's just talk over here. Obviously, remove wet clothing, right? Why? Because continues a cold environment. they're continuing to lose heat while they're soaked in the wet clothing. So even though it seems obvious, it ain't, right? Can't fix stupid. So remove the wet clothing. Cover them with blankets. Give them warm dough too, if you can. Most ambulances don't have the ability to do that. What is warm There's a way in the ambulance to warm the O2. It should say instruct partner to remove wet clothing. Um, obviously, number one, I didn't mention it again, but this is the number one treatment for all these emergencies, is remove the patient from the environment. Let's talk about these two things, okay? So. Patient number one and patient number two. Patient number one is alert and is responsive, okay? So they are alert and they are responsive. How do you know they're alert? Because they were able to answer person, place, and time. You know how to do that, good. What is the treatment? So now there's extra treatment, and we're gonna call that active rewarming. Learn this. Active rewarming only for which patient? Responsive. Res responsive or alert patients. Okay? Good. Active rewarming. How are we going to do it? So, on your ambulance, you have something called heat packs. They look like cold packs, but they produce heat. When you break them, they have an exothermic reaction between the chemicals inside. They produce heat. If they are responsive and alert, you are to place them in the following places. The neck, the axilla, and the groin. Simple? Right. All patients you cover in blankets. All patients you raise the heat in the ambulance should be on be way before you get to the patient, the back compartment. In these types of weathers, you should be heating the ambulance up. Frying, yeah. Why those three places? These are places that will aid the, the um, reheating the most rapidly. Okay? The Axilla question, in the armpit? What? Yeah. Okay? The question I thought you were going to ask is, why do they need to be conscious? Which I'll, I'll address anyway, even though you didn't ask it. But I was told you were going to. Yeah. Okay? So the reason is that if they are... Let's first just do the unresponsive patient. Unresponsive patient that seems to be having one of these cold hypothermic emergencies, you use passive rewarming. So learn these two expressions. 
guess. Active rewarming and passive rewarming. Let me just finish. I was going to guess. Passive rewarming will be using heated blankets, using blankets, and using the heat in your ambulance. What is the reason? You may burn them? Yeah, you may yeah. burn them. They, they can't tell you when it's too hot or, right? They are the, you know, well, sensation is coming you know, Sometimes even what's it called? You have a warm compress on their groin. You'd be like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> okay, like this, they know before you stop. No, but even sometimes you could, you could melt skin without even noticing. But they will know if they are responsive. I can tell you a story of two... Don't want to know. Let's move on. <laughs> tell me after that. All right? Good. Everybody got this? The, the key points here. Key points are remove from the environment, remove wet clothing, give all two. Check if they, if you think they're dead, check for up to 45 seconds, 30 to 45 is the wording that I've seen on state exams. Then you have active and passive rewarming. Okay? If the person's responsive and you're not finding the pulse. <laughs> what? You're not finding a carotid pulse? Oh, it's carotid. Yeah, yeah. That happens. My sister on my rotation. They were not able to. I had a 38. When we got the okay, but he was showing signs of life. He was talking. Right. So, so he was bradycardic. Don't do CPR. What? So if there's signs of life, you don't need it. That's good enough, right? The only reason we do ever a carotid pulse check is if we're not sure alive. somebody's dead or alive. No, I'm saying you're going from there and you're speaking about a no, no, person no. that's... No, 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 this is one section. Solid. This is separate, okay? I thought that was a continuation. Either um, ALS or hospital care, is there any way to accelerate the warming process no. of hypothermia? No. They would do nothing, to, there's no, no. drug... No. No, there are warming blankets that the hospitals have uh, that they can cover them with. But when somebody's at 82, 83 degrees and non-responsive, they just no warm fluids. We can we can put warm fluids through their body, but it doesn't really help. That probably feels okay. Now those are generalized injuries. Remember these two terms also. Generalized means the entire body. Local means one part of the body that's having the problem. Okay. Localized cold injuries. Usually, I wrote here ears, nose, fingers, and toes. I wrote that because it rhymes. It's true. Okay? But these are typically the places where you have localized injuries. Okay? People will get all dressed up in all the sweaters and the coats and the scarves and everything, and then they forget about their gloves or their earmuffs or all the stuff that they need. All right? For the winter. Okay? So, ears, nose, Fingers and toes. These are places that may be affected. Um, so we have two types of injuries, okay? Very similar to burns. Very similar to burns. And we call these early or superficial, right? We had that word with burns. And late and deep, okay? So it's sort of like first or third or however you want to. It's more like first and second. But think about it like that. So with early or superficial injuries, you have um, blanching of the skin, loss of sensation. Skin remains pliable. What I mean by that? What I mean is when you touch skin, you see how it moves around, it's pliable. It's not like this. This is non-pliable. Your skin is. Okay, every warm, tingling sensation begins, they start to get feeling back. And this is stuff most people have, have experienced. Now here we have a bigger problem. Uh, where the extremity or the fingers or whatever it is actually feels frozen. Okay, the extremity feels frozen. It may look um, like this blistering. Obviously, we don't break blisters. We know that. Um, and it may be swelling. How do you treat a blister? You cover them. Okay, so these may be the differences between the two signs and symptoms. But then you have the third stage where it's completely like... like Gangrene. Yeah. 
basically it's going to fall off. No? Well, it could happen here. Yeah, it could fall off. No. If, the, if it's frozen, you would think that. Depends on the... How many times it falls off? You put it in ice? How high is it? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> how would we treat these... <laughs> guys, guys, listen. Listen, there's a very complicated treatment coming up. Um, I'm not quite sure what this was trying to show. That's the heat pack. It's a what? That's a heat pack. Yeah, but it's blue, oh, so that would be ice. It was, it was it said very yeah, blue, it was a heat pack. Nah. Nah. <laughs> we have to put a red one. write the word heat pack on it. She's we got to put a red. So I'm not quite sure what that is. All right. So, look, really, really important stuff. Do not rub or massage the area. Do not. Don't Do not. rub it. That is one of the... Bite. Don't rub it. Don't rub it. Ari, don't rub it. <laughs> I'm a rubber. He can't help himself. So. Okay? <laughs> Do not re expose to the cold. When you wrap it up and get it all nice and warm, don't ask them to walk through 20 feet of snow to get to the ambulance, all right? Cover the affected part, maybe splint it. Splinting can be used many different <coughs> times. Whenever it would behoove you to splint, do so. Yeah, why do you think, why do you? What? Shouldn't the opposite of splinting? You mean moving around and... No, generating. do not. Do not rub or massage. Do not allow not them to it. move it. Why? No, Don't because rub it, he said. break bones. To make things worse. What if she's... Right? <laughs> now, late or deep injuries, okay? <clears throat> so, do not break blisters. Do not rub or massage. Rewarm or apply heat. Do not do any of these things. All right, listen carefully. There's a very strange... New York State Protocol, okay? It's one thing that I can honestly say I have never done, all right? There's not too much that I have never done. I have never used this protocol. And the protocol says like this, if your transport is delayed, you got to the patient, now there was another blizzard, and your ambulance can't move, and the patient has a late or a deep injury, this is what you're allowed to do. You're allowed to immerse the affected part in 105 degree water. Where are you going to get that in ambulance? Where are you going to get this from is my question. Very simple. If you're polyurethane. Very simple. That's why That's going to be 98.6. No, that's going to be... That's going to be 212 or 200. Boiling water is 200. They said not going to burn. No, he said polyurea. How do you know not going to burn? It's not because 105 is half of boiling. It's lukewarm. It's warm. It's more than lukewarm. It's warm. I feel like it's an uncomfortable. It's very warm. No, it's halfway to boiling. Well, what? what? Yeah, but, but it's still it's like no, running the hot faucet. Anyway, I don't know. I have this discussion with every class and every time I teach this. new buses are having a, a sink in them. I didn't hear a that. coffee machine. <laughs> but there's another problem. If you if you immerse it in the 105 degree water, wet. That's fine. Do not allow it to refreeze. So don't do it outdoors. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, well, where are you getting this exactly? One of five. You stuff. You have a house there, but yeah. you can't just you can just can't transport. You just yeah, keep, the keep, keep on going. Paint yeah, the thermometer. Paint. Not all the thermometers. Well, EMTs you? don't carry thermometers. Okay, but this EMT does. Right, they have a thermometer in the house. You yeah. measure the water perfectly. It's a red thermometer, though. You can use a turkey thermometer. <laughs> My shower has a degree on it. So they just think All right. <laughs> so that's that. Remember that. All right, that's cold done. Now heat. Oh, God. I don't know that. There are different types of heat emergencies. Okay, so there were two cold emergencies generalized, localized. Okay. Here we have some different types of heat One emergencies. Remember that? It's like generalized anesthesia or localized anesthesia. Yes. Same idea. Absolutely. You are. We're going to split these patients really into two groups. One group has moist, normal skin. The other group has dry, hot, usually red skin. So, what is the deal here? Well, just like just like with cold emergencies, the body has a compensatory mechanism, and we call that shivering. With heat, we have a compensatory mechanism. That's called sweating. sweating. Now understand what sweating does. What does sweating do? Cools the body. 
How? By re releasing hot juices. Yeah, when the water <laughs> evaporates, they cool your skin. No, it makes the body wet. Remember we spoke That's about... Exactly what the problem uh, when it's cold is. Yeah, it's healthy. right, you see? Making the body wet will help to reduce twenty percent reduce heat quicker. So that's why that's why Kodesh Baruch Hu made sweating to do that. That's the way we work. Remove from the environment, obviously. Give out two. Loosen and remove clothes. Um, you can. Here's the second time you're allowed to give your patient something to drink. First time you can give the patient something to drink was the Google. diabetic. Google. Diabetic, you can give them fruit juice, That's which great. I don't know why you guys were asking me about this. Told you clearly, you can give them fruit it's juice. No, you said apple juice, orange juice, or grape juice. Those That's are all fruit fruits. Juice, right? No, there's the also the nothing all technical. Juice. Apples I are fruits. I know. Pineapple Trust me. Is orange pineapple juice. It's cranberry. You didn't bring it this week. It's cranberry <laughs> pomegranate juice. Those are all fruits, yeah. also. Yeah. So Any fruit yeah. juice. Oh, now I, for the diabetic. Now I know. Avocado juice. Exactly. You confused us once again. That's a good question. <laughs> um. But depend on the sugar content, <laughs> which is not hard. There's a lot of fat. Yeah. There's a lot, lot of sugar. lot of fat. Not much sugar. Yeah. All right. Here you can allow your patients to drink water. Okay? Not fruit juice, Ari. Why are we not concerned? Because it doesn't matter. You're putting anything? sugar in it. Well, because they still have wet, <coughs> moist skin, you can give them something to drink. They're still conscious. Right? Now, guess what we can do with hot patients with dry skin? Nothing. We can, no, we can't. We can place cold packs where? Same, place. all the same places. Same places. Very good. We can wet towels and put that on top of them. Why would that be good? Because it cools you down. Right. And immediate transport. What, can you go back for one second? No. But you guys don't yeah. Meet the hot guy. Is he, a, is he awake or not? Okay. Wait. Yeah, right now he's awake. You guys don't pour the water? Yeah. No, you don't pour water. Right. Right you take a wide. towel, soak it, put it around. I learned a different All right. There are three types of heat emergencies. They're known as heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. You need to know these. You need to know the differences. Yitz will post this slide on the group. Um, I think I have. I think I have some. I think I have some. Uh, yeah, I hope you don't have this by the will you can. Oh yeah, I will. So heat cramps. What are heat cramps? Anybody ever ran or did any form of exercise no. and got some sort of cramp? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You know what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah when I was it happens to me every time I go down to do the laundry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Picking up the bags. Yeah. So, so heat cramps are the first thing. They will ask you, why do these happen? They will ask you, why do these happen? What we say is that this happens from a reduction in electrolytes or salt. Oh, okay. No way. That's a, yeah. Why do you think you guys drink pickle juice? Ever? That's the chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What? Gatorade. When you sweat, you salt. Okay. So this is one of the things that causes these cramps. Here you see uh, this guy holding his leg over there. He's got a cramp. She's got a headache. We just want to put a picture. Okay. All these things are possible. Um, so leg, abdominal cramps, um, dizziness, fainting. I guess that's what she's doing. So all these things are possible with heat cramps. These are not typically life-threatening. These people need to get electrolyte um, re replaced. Are you allowed to rub and massage? Stop doing the exercise. Heat, heat exhaustion. This is the next one. Now you see this guy. It's actually a great. It's a great picture. Yes, this is going up in severity. This is a great picture. I like this picture. The reason being like, that he's like soaking hugger? wet. Is it hugger? He's soaking wet, he's dripping, he's schwitzing, okay? This is exactly what he would look like. Now, why do we think this guy is going to be okay right now? He's because sweating. he's sweating. Yeah. Oh, man. So the water that he's producing... The sun is angry. Yeah. 
Sun's beating down on What's him. What's the map? Okay? Wow. Now, the problem is if you don't get them quick enough, you don't get him out of the Stoke. environment, Stoke. you don't cool him off, then he may go to Stoke. the worst one. This one is heat stroke. This is a true life threatening emergency, <laughs> okay, which can result in death. People can die from heat stroke. This is not serious, not minor at all. Um, they may have all sorts of problems they can have. They can seize, they can go unresponsive, Brain coma, uh, all sorts of things, all right? Um, basically, time? this is what happens when this isn't dealt with. What's the time? How is he able to get up by that second house? Well, I don't think it's the same guy. All right? Here, he is not drenched in water. In fact, he hardly has any... Thing left, Never. right? So you're saying these three are just stages? Okay. Stages, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Where does that come from? Uh, the heat. heat. When your body can't disperse the heat. Heat. When you're when you're in this situation with the sun that looks like that. Yeah. All right. These are the important things. Behavior I'm gonna run through very quickly. Can you give panic to someone? I see. You cannot know. Yeah. Behavioral. How do you prevent the heat stroke? Electrolytes? Yeah. yeah. You want to give it? No, you want to give let's just talk about. Let's just talk about professional athletes and sports, etc. Just to bring home a point. When they're playing professional sports, etc., they do not drink water. You ever notice that? Yeah. Why do they drink Gatorade? Sponsors. Not because of sponsors. <laughs> they could get Poland Spring to sponsor water. It's full of salt. Electrolytes. Okay, electrolytes. Okay. When you sweat, you don't sweat just water. You also sweat electrolytes. All electrolytes. Okay. Um, somebody that is running and does some sort of marathon or other type activity that is not used to this, that is not trained for this properly, we very often get called for these patients. They go into a state called hyponatremia. This is not something you'll be tested on on an EMT level. Hyponatremia is a low level of sodium low level of salt. The body requires a certain amount of each of these electrolytes, whether it's sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, etc., etc. We just call them all electrolytes. And the body works by using these. Without these, the body can't function. When somebody does these runs and, and uh, strenuous activity and exercise, they put out um, a lot of these electrolytes and salts, and all they do is drink water, and they're not replenishing them. And we very often get the call for these people, and they end up being hyponatremic. And this is not something you in the EMT school will learn how to deal with, or what it is, or anything. I'm just giving you a real-life example of these... Better to give them like a Gatorade than water. Absolutely. If they're doing strenuous exercise. So if, if you go exercise, yeah, it's all you recommend someone better take a bottle of water, a bottle of Gatorade than that. Absolutely. Than yes. You You're going to sweat. How do you treat a patient that's high for that treatment? That's we go uh, for, yeah, a, ten yeah, minute, that's that's for a 10 minute jog and it's 62 degrees outside. Right. Right. <laughs> if you're going to sweat and put out sweat. a lot of sweat, oh, yeah. right, then you're better off with something with electrolytes. Like Ryan doesn't sweat. Okay. Can I move on? Yeah, please. please. Thank you. I'm going to do these fast. There's a lot of stuff here, not much of which you need to know about. So it's going to go very fast. Behavioral emergencies, I think the most important thing is the definition. Okay? A situation where the patient exhibits abnormal behavior, keep reading, that is intolerable or unacceptable to the patient, family, or community. This is not a medical definition. This is not that you're do this person is doing X, Y, and Z. So what I always say is if somebody decides to wear a Met cap, 
right? That would be unacceptable oh, and intolerable <laughs> to the community. I'm leaving. So there are other such examples that you could bring, but it's oh, I really know, like a jet cap. Oh, my job. What you just said, I thought it was as moral excrement. <laughs> so, these are things that we would be concerned about. All right? Now, I love that picture. Yeah, these are the shrooms. Oh, those are the psychedelic, those are psychedelic shrooms. They're so shiny. <laughs> so, um, Basically, are there drugs involved, okay? Are there drugs involved, or is it a true behavioral emergency? Could it be a medical problem that is looking like a behavioral emergency? Like Very often, diabetes, stroke, CVA, head trauma, hypoxia, all these things that can be AMS can also masquerade as... As right, he might be a Meshuganah, but he might not be, okay? So you need to first rule out medicine before sending them to the funny farm, okay? Is he acting Meshuganah or is he Meshuganah? Right, so you need to know. Drugs, they cause people to do crazy stuff, yeah, right? They cause people, never mind. <laughs> if we decide that it is based what on... If we decide that it is based on something we're going to call behavioral emergency, then the person is deemed to be an EDP. And this is something that we use. This is the official terminology, emotionally disturbed patient. But that's not like a generic this person for, for any time a person It is, but you need to make sure that it's really an EDP. I'll tell you a very quick story. I don't like doing too many stories, but I think this will prove a point. I come off the highway on a Thursday night, exit 106. It must be between 11.30 and midnight. I come off the highway, I'm driving home. No. Thank you. Did you learn your geography? 107 is early Okay, we don't care. Yeah. Get off the highway and I'm driving up Broadway and there's a call and a unit for um, what was it called then? The Shawarma King was it called? What it used to be called? Change name. Shawarma King was on right off Broadway. On Broadway? Yeah. Any units for the Shawarma King? CH 38 to the base. So I'm driving up, I got nothing else particularly going on. It's and Thursday night, at midnight, I'm all alone. Shawama. And I'm like, Shawama. that's the best place to be. They got Chong, right? 38. Okay, they sent a bunch of EMTs. Before I get there. What was the call for? Before I get there. Place in order. Before I get there, an EMT gets on the air. Cancel all further, these are his words, cancel all further, it's just an EDP. So this, he's made this diagnosis within about 30 seconds of him getting there. I don't like it. I don't like it. No, I don't like it. I pull up, I get out, and I say, where's the patient? Oh, we canceled the medics, it's just an EDP. Where's the patient? I see the patient. I happen to know this patient, okay? He's not from my community, but still, I happen to know this patient. And I know that he has had multiple brain tumors and multiple operations, and he's taking a tremendous amount of meds to control his behaviors, and one thing or another. So I look at the EMTs, and now I lose it. Uh -oh. I'm like, and, then, the and now you're the EDP. You instantly <laughs> become the Shawarma King. Go ahead. <laughs> I say to them, who exactly said to cancel any further that this is just an EDP? I said, how in the 20 seconds that you're here were you able to obtain a full history and do an examination to know that this patient is an EDP. How were you able to do that? He said, you leave. 
That's it. So Send some more. Let me write you up. So we CH38 no. ventilate. Boom. <laughs> That's it. He was gone. He was gone. The other guys were friend to death. They didn't know what to do with me. I said, this guy is a serious, this is a chronic patient who needs his meds, who needs his family members who live very close by, and I've treated this patient before. So it just so happened that, you know, I was very familiar with the situation. Uh, this patient subsequently passed away a number of years later. Uh, he succumbed to these, you know, uh, brain tumors and one thing and another. However, he was not an EDP. He was not an EDP. So don't rush to label somebody. That's what this slide is all about. EDP is when you when you've exhausted all other options. Rule out medical. Don't ask me a sample. Mr. Davis, what if you had not known who he was? What would you have done? I would have done a full physical assessment of the patient. I would have asked questions. I would have found out his family. I would have brought people down, got people on the phone, take his cell phone, look for if the sign says ma, ta, wife. You know, find, figure things out. Do a proper assessment. Happened to me, I knew the patient. Okay, I had an, a leg up, an advantage, if you want. But it doesn't always happen. Suicidal intent, okay? Um, if patients say they're going to commit suicide, we take them seriously. They are considered to be EDPs, and they are transported. We don't say, oh, no, you're just joking and see it tomorrow type of thing. No, take it seriously. Um, don't uh, don't make light of it. What do they do to that's not your problem, all mine. They admit them to inpatient. Okay? We took, we took somebody there. So, I know that show. I don't. I just love that picture. So, basically, remember, is the scene safe? This is about scene safety, right? Was the scene safe for these guys? Okay? What was his intent? His intent was to hit the piñata, right? Not to kill all his friends. Was he using a chainsaw? For so it looks like a chainsaw. <laughs> that's okay. it. That's his. So I like that picture. That's why it's there. Um, remember, if the posture, if they're looking like they are going to hurt somebody, you will be first. So don't be in the way. Don't be like these guys. All right. I think it brings home a great point. This is between you and the dog. This is where you want to stand. Where you want to stand if you think there's an EDP on the other, in that room. In the doorway. That's where you want to be. Don't let anybody get between you and the door. Okay? That's where you want to be. If you have any hint, whether it's a smell, a taste, a look, or if you see that, <laughs> Okay? A breco. Anything. <laughs> you need to be right there. No further. Okay? Now you may need help. Um, SWAT team. <laughs> hey, additional resources, right? The guy looks like he's skiing. Okay? Um, Maybe we should change this more to an NYPD looking <laughs> caricature. Nice, nice friendly Asian cop. Well, the ones that can lose them? I, I was in with an EDP, eight cops, and they lost them out of the back door. Okay. So this is law enforcement. Okay, depending on where you live, you may have SWAT. We don't have SWAT in New York. Yes, we have ESU. Um, so you may need help. Get help. Okay, let's talk about what you can and can't do. All right, let's talk about consent. What do we know about consent? In four, that four different types. Three. Big deal. Next. What do they have to be? Have to be conscious of. Mentally. mentally competent. So what if these people are not mentally competent? They can't give consent. They can give? How do we treat them? Implied, Implied consent. consent. Look at that, Shraggy. You are definitely proximal. proximal to the suicidal intent slide. There was a test question. Yeah. 
I got it wrong. Listen, <laughs> Shraggy was proximal today, okay? <laughs> Get law enforcement assistance if you need it. Okay. Now, this is called... Medical ethical this is called protective custody. We cannot put patients in protective custody. Only NYPD or that guy, okay? I'm actually a police surgeon. Yeah. Who's the guy in the white with the police surgeon? Okay, so we cannot put people into protective custody. Um, this guy is, is handcuffed to the stretcher. How did that? An FDN, uh, a police, uh, a police yeah. officer precinct twice. Uh, we had to go to precinct twice. No, no, they're only Depends allowed. On what capacity is it? They're only allowed to do no. very, very basic amounts of treatment. They police officers in New York carry AEDs. They're not sure how to use them, and they also carry. They just carry them. They, just they carry, carry them. not carry. Totally I don't know if they really totally know how to use them them. them either. What do you mean? Ari, Ari, tell him the story about the cop no, in no. Narcan. Let's, let, let, let's move on. It's really yeah. late. Who's making these slides? Cop in the Narcan. <laughs> oh, no. He's the paper. That's no, the Narcan. That's the Narcan. Did No. Like but but they have to use. Go ahead. They're huge. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's breaking down barriers. It's breaking these? 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 It's it was in the paper a while ago. Oh, Pat made a box. Shutter Eli, Pat made a box for a. Uh, pulled over a car with fentanyl, illegal fentanyl patches. He didn't, he didn't use gloves to take them to the evidence room. And when he got back to the precinct, he passed out. They had to give him Narcan. He would need a fentanyl. Nice. Yes, remember patches of any type of medication don't, don't know whose skin they're on. They don't know that they're prescribed for Bob. <laughs> Now, when you touch them or take them off, they're going to go through your skin. Oh, Remember that. BSI. All right. These are called soft restraints. We carry these on the ambulance. They're um, as about as much use as a fifth wheel on a tricycle. <laughs> um, so I personally prefer to have PD. Okay? Because they're even less use. Okay? So, we do carry these, they're soft restraints, pretty useless. You're allowed to use cravats. Oh no, it's like, oh man, that's a scary grandma. So, yeah, she's upset. Um, this is about posture, the way they look. Does it look, does it look like they're violent, they're going to be violent? Do they look like this guy's trying to punch somebody, or she's going to hit somebody? Be careful. Watch what's going on. That's sickle cell pneumonia. No, that is um, uncontrolled temper. That's Might be. All right. Next topic. Focus. Ascent emergencies. Right. These happen during diving. Okay. This was a school question. Scuba question. Guys, this is a nice picture of an air embolism. Okay, that is a bubble of air that gets into the blood supply and causes a blockage. You want to shut the light so you can get a better picture of that? Thank Whoa. you. See that? Is that, that a pearl? Is that why they always on the shots they push it up to knock the air out? Yes. Well, that could kill you. They're exactly getting shot. That's why I know that could kill, they can kill yes. someone. Oh, that thing. So what? What is it? Well, they the yes, that's why we take air out of the IV tubing and the... Yes, I know what you were talking about, but now I do. Harry, why is your hands in my... Okay. <laughs> so, air... Air embolism. This is a dangerous, life-threatening scuba diving emergency. Okay? Get to treatment in a minute. Understand what it is. This is this ball pocket of air that gets caught in the brain in one of the blood vessels. Right? Just like there's not supposed to be blood in the bronchioles and the alveoli, there's not supposed to be air in the blood vessels. Right? It's supposed to be only contained in their gases. I just want to acquire an air embolism. Diving. Right, that's how you get it? So I put here very, 
very common, very simple terms. I can't go into too much detail. It's the pressure, pressure coming up too is. fast. Did it cause stroke? Okay. Is it, is it from the oxygen tanks? Is that what? No. No, no it's, it's from coming up too fast and the pressure inside and the pressure outside. Is it when they're too deep? Again, you don't need to know. It's when you come up. Too fast. Guys, guys, we'll talk guys, about it. Guys, it's 11 o'clock. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Double time, double time. Yeah. The, the other one is called decompression sickness. This has a slang name, the bends. Decompression sickness is called the bends. And this is to do with the gas nitrogen. Nitrogen can obstruct the blood vessel. Again, this is from three possible things. Okay, coming up too quickly, being down there too long, and repeated dives on the same day. You will not really be able to distinguish one from the other, but I give you these two things to think about. Air embolism generally occurs immediately when they get to the surface. They will have shortness of breath. That will be your number one key. Decompression sickness may happen many hours later, even a day. <coughs> we don't see much of this in New York City. People don't die in the Hudson. I know someone that's that. People die in okay. the Hudson. There isn't die. much <laughs> diving uh, except for in swimming pools, you know, that's really all that's going on in New York City. This happens by uh, uh, bridge workers, the, the, um, the construction workers that die. Basically, yeah, pools. like a suicide mission. Okay. The treatment, the treatment, and yes, this is a test question, is to get them to a hyperbaric chamber. In New York, it's Jacoby. Right, he's right. Only? There's a few of them. Yeah, I think there's a few of them. What does that do? Recompresses them. What's it called? Hyper Remove the patient. Here, some What's treatment. Hyperbaric. Hyper guys, guys. Right there. Remove the uh, right there, right there. patient right from the water. Keep them calm. Right Give them high con oxygen. Here, the blue. Test question. Hyperbaric. Oh, Ellie. Test question. Place you got this? Left, lower. Yeah. The head down. That's, oh. that's the difference with the head down, man. Okay. Ah, uh, that's not You put the light back on. Oh, no, sorry. That's, that's very cute. Yeah. Well, yeah. What the heck? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I have to use this in Williamsburg also, so. They want to see acute abdomen too, don't worry. <laughs> All right. The acute abdomen um, has many, many causes. There are many things that are going on in there. Many reasons. I just list here a couple. You don't need to learn these or worry about them too much. Um, here are some of the signs and symptoms that you may see. All right, nausea, vomiting. Remember, what's the difference between nausea and vomiting? The lack of vomit. Right? There's no vomit. Um, vomit could be with a nausea. Nausea, nausea is also a symptom. Vomiting is a sign. Good. Ooh. Point tenderness and rebound tenderness. Did I ever discuss this? No. Nope. 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 All right. When you palpate an abdomen, you're you've been taught how to do it, right? You press down like this guy's doing here. Yes. Yeah. We've been shown how to yeah. do this. No. Yes. Good. Tenderness or distension. Good. You're looking for tenderness, rigidity, and distension. Excellent. But now you gotta look for two more things with the medical patient, especially, right? You can't do this with the unresponsive. You need to ask the patient, does it hurt now when I push down? Yes. Or when I release? When I had an appendicitis and they took it out, they pushed down, didn't hurt, and when they let go, it hurt. Right, very good. Because the rebound tenderness, it's called, is typically found when there is infection going on. Right. Typically. So this I do a lot. I do this a lot on a lot of patients. I will test for an appendicitis, uh, especially, plus other infections that are going on in the abdomen. But certainly rebound tenderness would be a sign of infection. Point tenderness will be when you push in and it hurts. Now you can't really ask the patient, tell me when it hurts. So the best thing to do is find your landmark. Remember, we're going all four quadrants using the umbilicus as our center. 
and you look at the patient's face, don't ask them, does tell me when it hurts. Because they just if it's a man, they're gonna be like, ow, 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 ow. Right? Useless. And if it's a woman, she'll be like, yeah, is that all you got? Bring it up. So so what I do is while I'm palpating, you look at their face. You can see when they grimace or when it really hurts, they really show you that it hurts. What is, what is it, if it's point tenderness, then what is it? Yeah, what is it this is a sign of any sort of injury, usually. Okay, and now does this, does this uh, apply to other parts of the body, or it's only an abdomen? Abdomen, abdomen typically. Okay? You should add that in. Here you go. The thing in blue is a test question. Yes, position of comfort, face up, with the knees flexed. Yeah, I wrote that down. start saying study. quiz four, quiz five, or quiz six? <laughs> and, and the question number and the choice letter. So how do you position an acute abdomen patient for transport? Position of comfort, face up, hips elevated. Hips elevated, knees flexed. Exactly like that. How do you elevate? Put something on your knee? It's yeah, this is fine. No, how are you elevating the hips? It, they, it, when the knees are flexed, they become elevated. Is that like is, is that an evisceration? Like, is that what you're trying to show? Uh, no, not really, but it is, yeah. Techn but it doesn't matter. Technically, it's yeah. just the acute abdomen. He's just wearing camo. Okay? Um, don't give anything by mouth, keep patient warm, you know all this stuff, right? Vitals. Vitals and all that good stuff. One second, what's the last one? What's the PSI? How do you do this one? Yeah. Yeah. That's the same one. No, it's not.